Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing things, amazing things and amazing people just like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. But before I introduce today's esteemed guests, a little bit of housekeeping. Today is my 63rd birthday, so I have a very special show. What I would really love for my birthday, if you guys would just subscribe to my YouTube channel, I'm getting close to 200,000. I was supposed to get like a plaque at 100,000. I never got it. So, hey, just give me a subscribe if you can. First, I want to thank all the wonderful people for the wishes and the cards. And look at these beautiful flowers hey. in purple. These are from Heather McDougall, the daughter of Dr. John McDougall. And what is significant is Heather and I share a birthday. And Heather's brother, Dr. Mary Dr. John and Mary McDougall's son, Craig, has the same birthday as Charles. So the McDougalls never forget our birthday, which is they nice. Know. And one of our wonderful moderators, Jesse, Jesse and Suzanne and moderate, look at these flowers. So thank you so much. So, you know, I could have anybody I want on my birthday, well, I would hope, but I asked the two people that have probably helped me more than anyone in my life, at least in terms of becoming slender, or if you will, a skinny bitch, if I'm allowed to say that. In January of 2011, I went to the True North Health Center as a patient and I was 50 pounds heavier. I was on medication and these two guys changed my life and I thank them so much. If you don't know them, then you probably don't never watch anything I've done. They're the co-authors of The Pleasure Trap. It's a book that Dr. Goldhammer says, will that tell you what you want to know, but what you need to know. And I thought it'd be fun if we talked about like the top 10 things I learned from The Pleasure Trap. If you haven't read it, I'll put a link below. It's also an Audible and I'm the voice actor. So I really recommend you get the Audible version. It makes it a little bit easier to digest. And please welcome Dr. Alan Goldhammer and Dr. Doug Lyle. Thank you for spending some time with me on my birthday. Fantastic, AJ. All good. Good to be here. Thank you. Al, uh, Dr. Goldhammer, do you have anything to say? <laughs> You only learned 10 things from the pleasure trap? <laughs> no, actually, actually, I learned a lot more from both oh, of you. Okay, but in, I mean, we can go as long as you want because my birthday party is not for two and a half hours. But I thought I would start with one of the things. The first thing that I think you said ever that I heard at the True North Health Center is health results from healthy living. Would you both agree with that statement? And maybe you could expound on it a little. No, there's no question. Health is the result of healthful living. And the only debate is what does healthful living entail? From our viewpoint, diet, sleep, exercise, these are the critical components uh, that are going to determine both how long you live and how well you live. Yeah. The, uh, that, the, uh, that, just to expound, just because I, you know, a Alan likes to see how few words he can use. And I like to see how many I can get in. <laughs> the uh, if, if Alan wrote uh, wrote the pleasure trap, it'd be like it'd be like four pages long. Like that's it. This is it. This is all you need to know. So and if, and if he let me go, it would have been six hundred pages. So <laughs> the uh, so anyway, the that the principle health results from helpful living is actually an, uh, almost unbelievably profound statement. The um, and that statement ha has not uh, penetrated anybody's consciousness that lives within the world of modern psychiatry. So the same exact principle is parallel to the concept of happiness. Uh, these days, right now, uh, various and sundry uh, bad actors worldwide are in major positions of influence, and they are pushing all kinds of. Uh, agendas around the concept of quote mental health what's good for your mental health and I, I heard that about four times yesterday just listening to the radio on a basketball listening to a basketball game and I thought you know what this is pretty bad it's pretty insidious they're they're trying to maneuver in uh, a whole bunch of things about psychology that have no business you know they have no business in there happiness results from effective living that's what it results from. It results from doing a good job at achieving the sub goals of, of, uh, of esteem, where we are out there competing for esteem for mates, friends, and in trade. It also comes from being healthy. In other words, we are unhappy to a certain extent if we are suffering physically. So there are basically four and maybe five, you could, you could say that family 
is its own independent thing, independent of mates and independent of friends, but it really isn't because your children are basically your friends. And uh, uh, they're just as a uh, family is a special class of friendships, uh, but, but it, it winds up being really under the same types of dynamics. The, um, uh, but the bottom line is, is that your happiness, your overall uh, uh, satisfaction in any given 24 hour period or any given 10 year period has to do with the, uh, how well you, how effectively you have lived in terms of protecting your health and, uh, and achieving a good relationships and friendship, uh, romance and trade. If you haven't achieved in those areas, you aren't necessarily in trouble uh, happiness wise, but you're not as happy as you could be. And you will have deficits uh, in that area. It would be like Alan telling you, yeah, well, you haven't gotten rid of enough salt. You're 110 over 70. You're not too bad, but you're not as good as you could be. And the same thing is true with human relationships. So health results from healthy living actually echoed in my head in the last two or three months as I'm closing in on, on finishing the book that I'm writing, which is really, it's really the sequel to The Pleasure Trap, and it's about happiness. And I'm, I'm realizing that very same lesson, I first heard health results from healthy living from listening to Alan speak. That, that was more than 40 years ago. And the truth is, is that profound truth is the notion that we are designed by nature when things, when we are doing things properly and things are going reasonably well, we're supposed to be in a good mood. And when we are doing things properly and we're not badly unlucky, we're neither injured nor are we un unhealthy, okay? There are vicissitudes in that process where, you know, things go awry, you get hit by a, a blindsided by something and then you get rocked off your off your equilibrium, that's fine. But those are the, the critical thing about that lesson that Alan derived out of natural hygiene is the notion that uh, uh, de depression and pathological conditions and, and of any kind uh, are, are, are actually the aberrations that the system is beautifully designed for you to be healthy if you do the right thing. And it's beautifully designed for you to be quite happy if you do the right thing uh, and you have reasonably good circumstances. So that health results from healthy living is actually a, a very all encompassing and profound uh, thing where uh, profound insight, which one last thing that I'll say that also gives us a prescription about what on earth to do about it when people are suffering. In other words, we don't need to be adding a bunch of complicated crap and taking out a scalpel or flooding their brain with a bunch of crap. No, we don't need to do that. All we need to do is generally remove the obstacles that are getting in the way of the system returning to its natural equilibrium, which is health and happiness. It's no, you know, Alan uh, very carefully wrote the subtitle of The Pleasure Trap. He took uh, a while maneuvering words around, really thinking deeply about what we were trying to say. And he came up with mastering the hidden force that undermines health and happiness. So the, the happiness component, you know, is not talked at length in the book, but the concepts are sitting there because they're in parallel. So anyway, that's what I have to say about that. Something I was just thinking about, Doug, that we haven't talked about before, but, you know, in health, you have parameters. You can take blood pressure and blood sugar levels. And if the blood pressure is too high or the blood sugar is out of whack, you can assume that the system's out of whack. Yeah. And I'm wondering, are anxiety and depression and the other symptoms people experience psychologically basically analogy, analogous symptoms that, you know, if you have anxiety, it's a sign there's a, something out of balance. If you yes. have depression, there's a, something out of balance. And just like we try to do physically, try to correct the reasons why that happens and not just give pills and potions. So it's essentially it'd be the same kind of thing for psychology exactly the same thing and you know what alan you're gonna you're gonna uh, <clears throat> for those of you that don't know but you should be able to guess alan always waits for my productions and he's like geez how over budget and how over time are you going to be i would have had this done a lot <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but now you're going to be impressed about why it is that I've taken my time. The truth of the matter is the anxiety and depression are almost exclusively uh, the result of the fact that we are not living in a Stone Age environment. 
So when people think about people that have, quote, pathological anxiety, uh, those people, like, for example, let's take social anxiety, where people are really afraid about meeting new people. They're being encouraged by their therapist to join things and go out and do things and go to Toastmasters and all this kind of stuff. The truth of the matter is uh, those people would have been fine in a Stone Age environment. Right. They would have spent their lives around the 40 or 50 people that they knew all growing up and that effectively they, they just have a hypersensitive, they're like a smoke alarm in the Louvre. In other words, they're worried about new people and they are, they're worried about the possible negative consequences that could come from interacting with them. So they would never want to put themselves in a group of a bunch of people that they don't know that well. This could be potentially costly. Now, you might say, well, if you're an extrovert, you're like, why not? And the answer is you're built differently. OK, so but but the truth is, is most of what we see as pathological in psychology is not pathological. It's nothing other than a derivative of the fact that people are not living in the in the village atmosphere that they were actually designed to live in. It would be very difficult for people to be brooding and depressed and just and 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 unproductive uh, the way that they can sometimes get in the modern environment. You couldn't get that way in the modern environment in, in the Stone Age environment. You had to be productive every day. People have problems with their sleep. They're 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 what do you call it? Uh, insomnia. Uh, there's no insomnia in the Stone Age. You work like crazy all day long and you go to sleep and you sleep fully. There's no obesity. There's no high blood pressure. There's uh, there's uh, no, and there is no social isolation. That's impossible. Uh, and so there's no ego trap where you are intimidated your whole life because you got most likely to succeed. And then it turns out that you've you know been defensive and self destructive ever since. Impossible. Any extra status that you ever got for anything, if you it was overrated, you got you had to give it back the next week. Okay, because people could see that, oh, you got a little lucky. Okay, so there'd be no Simone Biles bailing out on the Olympic Games, uh, et cetera. None of this would happen. So you're, uh, it, it's actually astonishing when you realize how, how much human uh, psychological misery is gone when you go back to the Stone Age. There's no addiction in the Stone Age, no addiction, no obesity. You take those two things off the table. You've taken off a huge component of human psychic distress in the United States today. Okay. So, and then you take away all loneliness. That's gone. There is no loneliness in the Stone Age. All there is is you got dumped. Oh, well. And your friend says, I saw that coming, Doug. She was too good for you. <laughs> That's no shock. <laughs> The uh, so anyway, when you when you really get down to it, and that's the beautiful thing uh, from this thing as we see this thing coming full circle now uh, philosophically, that that uh, you go back to the Stone Age and we find human beings getting healthier and happier. Uh, it, not not all humans, but when you see a pathological condition or someone really struggling, usually the first move on the chessboard is. How is your life different than it was in the Stone Age? We need to change it back towards Stone Age parameters, and we're likely to have success. Thank you. And Dr. Goldhammer, did you coin the phrase health results from healthful living? And what is healthful living? So healthful living means living consistent with your basic nature. And we focus on diet, sleep, and exercise as being the most dominant factors in, that are within your a purview. And I did not coin that term. That was a, a term that came out of natural hygiene. Great. Thank you. Well, so the next thing I learned from, well, Dr. Goldhammer says this a lot, but I'm curious if you agree, Dr. Lyle, women are energy conserving, estrogen producing fat storage machines. <laughs> Is that true? I can't tell <laughs> well, absolutely true. Females yeah. of all species biologically have to store fat at a higher percentage than males because they have to survive a period of biological vulnerability called pregnancy. Yeah. No males, uh, at least no human males, have babies, no matter how they identify. The, the fact is, if you're gonna ha you have to be a female in order to, to produce a baby. And I've heard some people suggest that one of the differences 
between males and females is that male species just are females that never fully develop. But you know, that's just some deal. <laughs> so the bottom line is women had to have higher biological stores of fat in order to survive the career biological mobility. Estrogen amongst its many uh, functions allows women to more efficiently store fat. If you inject men with estrogen, they get fat, they grow breasts, they get hips. If you put enough testosterone, the male hormone in females, their fat will melt off them. The problem is they'll get hairy and get cancer and die. So it's not like an effective weight loss strategy. And so these are biological differences. If you have a male and a female and everything else being equal, do exactly the same thing, the male will lose weight faster than the female will lose extra weight. And, and it's not psychological, it's biologically based. So to deny that there are these differences is not accurate. All, all good, AJ. He, def he, defend he did defended himself with honor. Okay, as long as, and feel free to disagree. Okay, so the other thing, um, Dr. Goldhammer, I've often heard you say, we live in a world designed to make us fat, sick, and miserable. How is that the case? And do you agree, Dr. Lyle? Right now, the world is designed to give you what you want, not necessarily what you need. And so getting what you want is short-term pleasure-seeking self indulgent behavior, stimulate as much dopamine as possible, feed the pleasure trap. You know, that's the basic nature of how you make money. You don't sell against the pleasure trap. You give people what they want. But what they want isn't always the same as what they need long term. And so what ends up happening is people consistently overeat. They get fat. Some of that fat is visceral fat. It produces inflammatory markers that cause heart disease, diabetes, autoimmune diseases, and certain types of cancer. And then, you know, that's the essence about why we're getting uh, fat, sick, and miserable. because we're overfeeding ourselves and it's because of the pleasure trap we're stimulating artificially stimulating the dopamine production in our brain so we consistently eat the hyper concentrated foods and unless you're aware of it consciously it's almost inevitable and that's how 70 percent of the population and growing in industrialized countries are overweight even though they're trying desperately not to be so they can't help it yeah totally uh, without a doubt it's just a matter of uh, you know, th there are individuals that by, by virtue of their uh, genetics, they will escape the consequences. So there's always a George Burns out there that's smoking and drinking and living in 99. The, uh, and so, but, but that doesn't, that's not a, res as a result of any uh, superb personal, you know, psychological defense against the pleasure trap. It's just genetics that he's an uh, indestructible human uh, and, and therefore he escapes the consequences of, of the, the imbalance the, all it is, is that the, the imbalances between the, the modern, uh, world and, and our contact with it and our natural design are going to cause perturbations in our psychological and physical functioning. The only question is how much, so there's going to be some, there's some, uh, very unfortunate young lady right now that as a result of her exposure to a high animal food diet, she will, you know, she's 13 now, but she'll die in her mid thirties from breast cancer. Uh, that breast cancer is completely preventable. If she, if she were to stop eating that food right now, there's a good chance that she would never manifest that disease. Okay, so the, um, so certainly a huge percentage of, of the, the, the fat, sick and, miser and misery that we see is a direct result of, of human beings uh, sort of re-engineering their relationship to nature. And obviously much of it has been spectacularly successful and much of it, uh, the, the, the story of the pleasure trap is the two-edged sword of human innovation. That, it, that it, it's not like there aren't blessings of civilization uh, and, and, and human innovation. There are many blessings, the, uh, however, there are hidden costs that are not well identified. And those hidden costs, uh, you know, is what we document in the pleasure trap. Thank you. Uh, when you eat healthfully, healthy food tastes good. Well, if you do it long enough so that you can neuroadapt to a healthy diet, if you're used to eating greasy, fatty, slimy, dead, pain flesh, Good food's going to taste like tasteless swill and disgusting, and you're not going to want it. But if you keep eating it long enough to neuroadapt, 
eventually good food starts to taste good. We found you can make that happen even more quickly with fasting. And we've done a study recently where we actually did, we were able to detect the minimum thresholds to salt and sugar and hedonic response to salt and fatty, sugary, fatty foods, and found that after fasting, good foods do indeed taste better to people. And that the, the health compromising foods become somewhat less uh, attractive, at least for a while. But like most addictions, if you keep artificially stimulating dopamine production in your brain with exposure to these chemicals, you can become addicted. That's the nature of addiction. Yeah, I, I don't I don't really think any of that's in dispute at this point. There's been some major books uh, that have that have documented it more thoroughly this and there's been more science, you know what I mean, in the last years later. Years since since we wrote. So uh, yeah, I, I don't think that anything that, that we said, actually, I think everything we said stands up super well to what, what's been discovered in the last couple couple decades. But people keep saying, my kid doesn't like healthy food. Right, there are kids in addicts. Yeah, yeah uh, I've heard many things like, uh, my kid just, they, my Dr. Lyon, my kid won't eat. And it's like, oh yeah, they won't. <laughs> yeah, so... This is, you know, it's one thing that a teenager is going to going to get a, have a bicycle and have enough strength and capability and assertiveness to go, go down to the liquor store. You're not going to stop that. But your seven year old, you've got an awful lot more control over that situation. And so there, there's really no no reasonable excuse to not be exercising pretty good control uh, over your kid's diet. You can't control what they're going to do in other places. That's fine. But in your own house, you can have very reasonable standards. And if they don't want to eat it and they're upset about it, that's okay. Eventually they will. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Well, speaking of food, sugar, oil, and salt are not foods. They're chemicals we add to the food that fool our brain's satiety mechanisms and cause us to exponentially overeat. So food, oil, salt, and sugar are hyper-concentrated byproducts from food, where we've taken a natural component and concentrated it. And so, you know, that's, that's why we say they're not actually whole food, but rather concentrated food byproducts. And we put those back on the carrier agents that we're using, whether it's wheat, soy, uh, uh, whatever, uh, to make our brain respond more intensely than they would naturally. You can chew on sugar cane and you would taste the sweet. But if you take a big bunch of sugar cane, take a component out of it uh, called sucrose and give it, you're going to get a more concentrated response because your brain's designed for an environment of scarcity. We're getting the most to eat of the most concentrated you possibly can are the people that survive. Your ancestors were not the ones that, oh, no, you first, you first. You're necessarily all polite. They ain't God. They're the ones that got enough to eat and didn't get eaten. Most humans didn't live to reproduce. They didn't pass on their genes. They're the losers. Your relatives were the winners. They got on that long boat ride. They survived. They probably ate everybody else for all we know. <laughs> I love that. One of the one of the great scenes was Al and I went to uh, some veg fest. It was at, in Pennsylvania, and I can't remember State College, Pennsylvania. I think it was. I think it was Vegetarian Summerfest. Yeah, Vegetarian Summerfest. We went there, and uh, we were. We were eating and we and we're at we were like loading up our plates and then we sat down to eat and we and we and Alan said he goes he goes turn around and look and the salad bar had nobody in front of it and there's like a, a dozen people waiting in line at the like the frozen yogurt thing and it's like okay there it is here are these people that are that are the yeah, among the most the best educated and most motivated people in the United States. And, and here, here we are in a group of 60 or 70 of them. And none of them are in front of the salad bar and they're all lined up for dessert. <laughs> and at that, at that moment, you start to realize, wow, trying to sell the message of the pleasure trap is selling against the pleasure trap, which uh, makes it inherently one of the most difficult sales uh, that you'll ever do. Wow. You know, I, I have a question, though, for myself about that, you know, because I know you guys have always said we're genetically hardwired to always prefer the most concentrated source of calories in any environment. 
And I was thinking about that as I ate my lunch today for my birthday. I mean, it's my birthday. I could have had anything. But my favorite food is something called pho. It's a Vietnamese soup. The chef here makes it for me with no sugar, oil, salt. The noodles, he doesn't use flour. He takes giant mushrooms and like pretends they're noodles. It is literally the most calorically dilute thing you can eat. But it's the most, I love it. Like, is there something wrong with me? Well, I mean, we know that's true, but. <laughs> no, no, the truth of the matter is, is that to, to say what we said, uh, we're, we're making a point, and, and this is, uh, in, in statistics, you call this a main effect. In other words, there may be 50 variables in trying to understand, you know, uh, why, why some human being uh, decides to blow a, a, a police whistle. But the truth is, is that there is one major factor or three major factors as to why they blow the police whistle. Okay, so the um, <clears throat> or why why they why they sign up for swimming at the Y. There's there's three big reasons and there's fifty little tiny reasons. And so when we uh, when we're making the point that calorie density is the dominant force in the decision. We are not saying it is the only force in the decision. We are just simply saying that it is the dominant force in the decision. So we can see inside your preference that there's other little things. So your cook actually ingeniously uses products that probably mimic salt, okay? So you're not actually getting sodium, but you're getting something that is actually cleverly tickling the circuits of that sodium. Uh, and therefore, you know that, that's impacting your decision-making. And so when you're eating, you're not just eating for calorie density, because if that were true, people would just eat sticks of unsalted buzzle, butter or they would guzzle oil, which they don't do. Now, I've seen some people that eat pretty close. <laughs> I've, I've seen it close. But the truth is, is that what we see is a main effect for calorie density. And the main effect for calorie density is undisputable. You see that what people are eating is fried, dried carbohydrate. That's what people want. It. They, they want something fried and that they want the carbohydrate dried out. So a French fry is a dried potato that is now fried in oil. Now that, in other words, by, by making it as calorically dense as we can reasonably make it, uh, that, that tends to be what everybody wants. It isn't the only consideration, but it's the main effect. Have you ever been to a fair, Doug? Yeah. I, I actually, the last time I went to a fair was probably with you. It was okay. Sonoma County Fair. And I, it's funny you asked that question because I have, you know, it, impressed into, embossed into my memory. With, I think it was you and I were watching these people with this enormous waffle cone with, <laughs> I can't even remember what on earth was in it. But I remember looking at that thing thinking, that's like 3,000 calories is sitting in that guy's hand. And and I couldn't believe that anybody would eat such a thing. I think it was fried ice cream. I think it was fried ice cream on a waffle cone. And I remember us just looking at that and thinking, that's unbelievable. The other thing I remember about that also was uh, was watching horses from close range. And I couldn't believe how dangerous horse racing was. I had never been up close to a horse race. And, and watching them go by from not too far away, I thought those people are absolutely out of their minds. So anyway, that's what I remember. But yeah, a fair. <laughs> Waffle cone at the fair. There you go. Nice. There's a funny comment uh, from Susanna. And she said, you guys cracked me up. Tasteless swill is exactly how the food tasted when I started, but it doesn't taste that way anymore. And thank you for the super chat donation. Okay. The next thing I hear Dr. Goldhammer say a lot is just because something is less bad doesn't mean it's good. Well, that's an important point because right now we, they spend a lot of time trying to justify behaviors based on the fact that it's somewhat less bad than something else. Olive oil is less bad than cottonseed oil. Then they tell you how terrible cottonseed oil is. And, you know, I don't disagree. Olive oil may be somewhat less bad than cottonseed oil, but being not as bad is not the same as saying something's health promoting. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, what's lost in, in almost all discussions, actually, as far as I'm concerned, it's in all discussions. So, the discussions that, that I have with Alan, uh, we, we enter this arena. Uh, if I talk to Colin Campbell, we enter this arena. 
I don't know that anybody else that I've ever had any conversations, a couple of my friends. And that is that the truth is actually in the fine statistical details. So uh, less bad, how much less bad? By what criteria? How, how did you arrive at it? And at what level? In other words, the, the truth of, of the relationship of food and other things to your health is uh, difficult to assess. And if you look at a whole bunch of different research that's attempting to honestly figure it out, you will probably be able to, over time, get a reasonable estimate of the parametric uh, impact of a certain thing. Uh, I think that uh, one of the more interesting uh, things, uh, I'll, I'll just expound on this for a minute. The uh, sometime in the, in uh, probably 2006, 2007, 2008, um, I was not knowing what big project I would do next. And I, uh, I didn't know, uh, I, I consider health to be inherently very interesting and I'm very interested in it because it's such a big feature of human life. However, it's not, it's not everything. And so I was, but I was still intrigued. <laughs> Alan's like, what do you mean? <laughs> the thing is, is that I was, uh, but I had some open loops about health and there, there are always going to be some open loops, uh, unanswered questions, but I actually sort of wanted to know for myself as I was looking at my own mortality, I was in my mid forties and I was, uh, I was thinking, you know what, what am I actually likely to die of and what I, what I ought to be looking out for? So what I did was I actually went into the CDC database and I spent a lot of time there looking at what everybody dies from. And the uh, and and I broke things down uh, rather than taking anybody's word for it. I broke it down, you know, condition by condition by condition by condition. I discovered a lot of very interesting things. Um, and one of the things <clears throat> that was interesting to see was that your odds of dying of cancer at that point were about, if you're a non-smoker, were about 16%. Turns out it's gone down a little bit uh, in, in the last few years. So it's maybe down to 13% now for, for whatever reason. The uh, uh, problem, oh, I know why. And that's because the curves on cigarette, the ending of the cig cigarette says, cigarette use is it's still changing the stats. It <clears throat> makes medicine look great, but the truth is this just has to do with the fact that Fewer and fewer uh, people are, have been smoking for as long as time as they used to. So anyway, the bottom line is I looked at this and uh, and then I, I could see that in the in the highly in the the, the small samples of very good eaters, uh, there isn't that much difference. There's some difference, but there's not that much. And that always bothered me. And it bothered me and bothered me. And the truth is, I hadn't quite identified the contradiction. The contradiction came out of the fact that, you know, in reading the China study carefully, Colin was making the case about animal protein being this chief catalyst. And so, <clears throat> so in the pleasure trap, Alan and I wrote about how <clears throat> this is a reprieve for the asking, get out of the animal food, et cetera. And then in retrospect, I'm looking at the actual data and thinking mm, it's a partial reprieve, but it's not nearly the reprieve that I thought. And so that bothered me and bothered me and bothered me. And then Colin uh, wrote a book recently called The Future of Nutrition, the last couple of years. And at the end of that book, he reprints or shows once again the argument of worldwide epidemiological data showing very, very low rates of cancer where there's low animal food. And I bothered me and it bothered me. And then the light went on finally after 20 years. <clears throat> and I realized, oh, it's lifetime exposure. And so I called up Alan. Alan's the first person I called. I said, hey, Alan, I think I understand this is lifetime exposure. And Alan said, hey, that's pretty good. I'm going to talk to Colin. <laughs> and the point of all this, God knows, where on earth did we start this question, AJ? I forgot, lost my thread. Oh, gosh. Um, Who knows? Oh, no, the truth. Okay. Just because something Not is this truth. bad doesn't mean it's good. Something is this bad. The truth of the matter is, the truth is often complicated and it's tricky to figure it out. And the answer is going to come from really honest, intelligent, statistical analysis. So when we hear people arguing and snarling over things and saying, this is really good for you, that's less bad for you, et cetera, et cetera. You're like, all of this is meaningless chatter. 
The truth of the matter is, as Alan would say, the safe place to go is to whole natural pristine food. We know that. Anything else, if you're going to have it in your diet, you better have pretty damn good reason to defend it that you don't know it's a problem. Okay. Now, I know that there's a lot of things that have some processing that are not a problem for an awful lot of people. Like if you eat Ezekiel bread, okay, that we know that that's a healthy, you know, it's a processed carbohydrate, but that thing is not in any line to give you heart disease or cancer or any known pathology. But Alan would say, look out, you know, it's probably salted up a little bit and it's concentrated artificially dried carbohydrates. So it's going to make you fat. And who the hell eats Ezekiel bread without putting anything on it? What the hell are you putting on it? So that your, your reprieve will last about eight seconds till he gets warmed up. And also, it's often made from wheat. Wheat contains gluten, and the HLA DQ gene that's present in a third of the population that makes insensitivity to that might aggravate the arthritis for Hashimoto's thyroid eyes with a celiac disease. So, right. you know, because you wouldn't take wheat, for example, boil it and eat it because it's disgusting. You know, yeah. Mostly. And so anything that you can't eat whole and you have to process it, you better be suspicious. Uh, all, all, all reasonable. So that's actually a very good. Uh, well, but it's less call, bad. Right. Well, we would call that um, a first approximation. So the first approximation is eat food that you can eat whole out in its natural state. The second approximation is if you can include other things, you better have reasonable scientific support to know that you're not wandering into trouble, okay? So, uh, and an awful lot of things that are obviously being promoted because they're incredibly convenient to sell and they're pleasure trap foods are being sold as, quote, better than something else, which is worse. And that that is no argument at all. It's a total empty suit. I like low tar cigarettes. Right. Perfect, AJ. That is exactly what it's like, is low tar cigarettes. Yep, absolutely. All right, here's one that I love. Dr. Goldhammer, you have all, well, you may not know that you've always said this, but I, I, I hang on every word. Show me an overweight person, and I'll show you a person unwilling to eat enough raw salad and steamed vegetables. Well, the point is, if you eat enough low density, low caloric density, high nutrient density food, it makes it much more challenging to consistently overeat. So one of the big tools is just eat enough of the low density stuff so that when you do eat higher density foods, that you have less chance to indulge in. If you just eat high concentrated calorie foods, it's almost inevitable you're going to overeat. Whereas if you can eat enough of the good stuff, many people find that helps them manage their weight more effectively. Yeah. Well, you've said it's impossible to sustain obesity if you eat enough. I just have never yet. Now, I've only doing this for 40 years, though. So it's a limited, you know, a limited sample. But so far, I've never met anybody that generously eats a variety of whole natural foods that ends up with obesity. Some people are a few pounds more than they think they ought to be. You know, they may not look like the heroin addict on the fashion magazine that's been photoshopped. But as far as obesity and health compromising situations, that's not real in people that are doing and following these advices uh, strictly. I, I'd love to actually meet the person that could violate the laws of physics and thermodynamics because it would make a fabulous case report, but so far I haven't seen it. Yeah. Have, have you, Dr. Lyle, seen anyone violate the laws of thermodynamics? Um, I have. I've seen people that that are clearly genetic outliers. Okay, so Alan actually knows this person, uh, but you barely met her. Uh, but but I had a client that was in her 30s, was 5'4 and 360 pounds. And um, <clears throat> and that individual uh, was extraordinarily conscientious. And so, um, so her first pass was eating a standard McDougal diet, and that got her down to 280 or whatever it was. And... Then her next pass was to essentially eat a true north diet. And she came down to about 230, 240 in that range. Okay. And then what she did was she started, um, <clears throat> then she was measuring her food very, very carefully. Okay. So she's literally consciously overriding her natural instincts and had enough discipline to do it and got all the way down to like 180 or so. Okay. 
and then couldn't defend it because she was essentially fighting the hunger drive and wound back up at 240 frustrated. And then I suggested, uh, uh, I remember Alan saying, well, if I was ever in real trouble like that, I would just go all raw or something very close to that. Okay. So we did. So she went to a very heavy raw food diet and then something strange happened. Uh, she lost quite a bit of weight, but she was actually not well physically. In other words, it just what it's not a good match for a lot of human beings, uh, uh, however, however it is that they're designed. And so she gave up on it. And so, so that was that was an individual that that um, I, I know is you know as Alan says, if you you look at a population of a million people, your 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 top one tenth of one percent, uh, one in a thousand is going to be a, a very unusual individual, whether it's they're, they're going to be six foot nine inches tall, or they're going to have extraordinary uh, efficiency in their ability to store fat, uh, or their intelligence, there's going to or their athleticism, you start getting out there one in a 1000, one in 10,000, you're going to get some rare things. So, however, this is not the rank and file that we <laughs> The calls on the phone and say that they're having trouble. No, the, these are true outliers. And of course, those exist in human nature. And we're going to find if uh, in the future, when you look at the genetic codes of such individuals, we're going to find, oh, my goodness, they've got 67 of these genes, which the normal person has three. OK, so we're going to find some super unusual genetic configurations out there. But so is it possible? Of course it's possible, just as it's possible to, I guess, be, be born inside of another human being who's living on the outside and you're on the inside. I mean, there's, there's some really un bizarre biology things that take place uh, in, in, in life. And, uh, and so having someone who is bizarrely you know, obese, of course, of course it's possible. It's just exceedingly rare. Do, do either of you agree with something that Dr. McDougall often says that he learned from Dr. Kempner? And I don't want to say all, but maybe that most dieters are liars because I can't, if I had a nickel for every time somebody said, I eat exactly like you, I do everything you say and I can't lose weight. And then I'll be with them at an event. And I'm like, you don't eat remotely like me. Well, you can actually argue that, you know, who often have integrity problems, not just people who are dieting, but just the human, the race, the whole species, you know, has, has some integrity issues. And a lot of times they lie to themselves, so they don't, they're not even aware they're lying. They're just misrepresenting the facts, and they've done it so effectively that they've convinced themselves that, you know, that's actually what's real. So it's not necessarily a conscious and, and pernicious attempt to deceive. It's just they're delusional. Well, it's even worse than that. I, I can tell you, AJ, um, because so many people that I talk to are fans of yours. And so they will uh, tell me, I'll listen to somebody and I'll, I'll hear the high intelligence. And I'll hear the high conscientiousness and they, I'll hear the frustration and they will explain to me that they're doing everything perfectly. And then I start asking them what they're doing and they clearly are, are, are they're, they're clearly not attempting to deceive me because they just flat out confess all their sins. All it takes is a couple of questions. And then I'm very gentle about explaining, you know, hey, actually, guess what? You actually weren't following the rules quite. And, and, uh, and here, here we need to go. So I have to tell you that, that uh, people's, People's grasp of the details that we're trying to uh, to to share with them is often incomplete, and they, they don't actually get. They don't translate what's wrong with vegan pizza. Like they didn't quite get it. It's like it's whole wheat vegan pizza. What's the problem? And the answer is it's a dried carbohydrate. It's processed food. It's 15, 1600 calories a pound on the crust. What the hell? Do you, I don't say what the hell do you think is going on. But well, that's you're very thing. kind, Doug, because I know at the center we used to occasionally get those people that were supposed to be like the examples you were laying out, the biological exceptions. Yeah. And then we installed security cameras. And so we could actually see when people were leaving. And boy, I'll tell you what, almost all of our questions just disappeared overnight. <laughs> the, uh, what's I going to say? 
I can't. I forgot. I forgot. That, that people are sometimes underreporting or mi misreporting. Oh, yeah, I was going to say there's a uh, another thing that I've said, and this is not to pick on people, but I will say that I, I'd say that there's a special vortex between the McDougal program and the True North program that miraculously, when people actually go there, they start to lose weight. And it's like, huh, that's amazing. They were eating exactly those same foods in the last year, and they were. 50 pounds overweight, but actually, you know, they, they started immediately losing weight as soon as they wound up in, in uh, Santa Rosa. So that's, that's the truth. <laughs> yeah, great. I love that dried and fried. Okay, so the next question we could probably devote a whole episode to and it's about my favorite chapter of the pleasure trap. My favorite chapter isn't losing weight without losing your mind. It's not getting along without going along. It's chapter six. And uh, before I do that, I just want to show you the difference of the personalities between Dr. Lyle and Dr. Goldhammer. So Dr. Lyle signed my book with a little drawing and he said to AJ, you are one of a kind, always a great pleasure, Doug. And Dr. Goldhammer goes to AJ, beware of the blitter trap. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the difference is one is warm and fuzzy and one tells you not what you want to know, but what you need to hear. So chapter six is called looking for health in all the wrong places, mental biases, health by subtraction. One, one of the things I love the most about you guys is you're willing to disagree when to tell the truth. And I, I respect and love everyone in the plant-based space. They're always a guest on my show and welcome. But there's so many bean pushers and nut pushers that have you believe that if you don't have an ounce of nuts a day or take, you know, a fatty acid, uh, that liquid thing or eat beans, you're going to drop dead. And I've heard you both say that there is no one particular food that everyone needs to eat. But in fact, most problems are caused by excesses and not deficiencies. Absolutely true. You know, in the world of our ancient ancestors, deficiency was a dominant fear. And we were designed to avoid deficiencies by making sure we got enough to eat and didn't get eaten. And we're really well designed. And in the natural setting, we'd have a good chance of survival. But in the modern world of hyper-concentrated foods, it makes it almost inevitable uh, to get into trouble unless you consciously override it, unless you become aware of the trap. And that's the point is even the most, you know, well-intentioned person can easily get sucked into the pleasure trap. It's, it's, it's kind of the, the default. The fact that anybody doesn't is kind of the surprise. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that, the, that is a, again, once again, this is the, the uh, I, I call it the village template. And that is that if we, we look whatever the problems are, and what we want to place over the top of the problem is a template from the Stone Age village. And so the, if we look at a Stone Age village, the vast majority of Stone Age villages throughout human history, nobody ate a single net, not a single one. The vast majority of Stone Age villages throughout all of human history, none of them ate a single bean. Okay. So anybody that says that you need nuts or beans to be healthy is just freaking out of their mind. They don't understand anything about human evolution. It's just gross ignorance. Of course, that's not true. Okay. So human beings have the widest palate of any animal on earth. There's a reason that's true. And that is that they are the widest ranging land animal on earth. Isn't that interesting? Those two facts are not coincidental. So human beings had to, if they're going to continue to forge into new habitats, which they did after leaving Africa, and then moving up through Asia and then down to Australia and then across the Bering Strait and then down into the Americas. If you're, uh, it's not like they traveled this, the people were moving five miles a generation for God's sakes. They're just moving down the river a little bit and then moving another down the river a little bit. So little by little by little, they moved into virgin territories and they did that because they were having competition for food at the previous territories that were saturated with humans. That's the only reason you'd ever leave Africa. And so uh, as a result of that, you had to, you had to be able to uh, withstand slight differentiations in food, food stuffs little by little by little. And at the end of the day, we, we, we wind up with a species that is an omnivore with an extraordinarily wide palate. 
That doesn't mean that you can eat everything. If you ate the diet of a chimpanzee, you would die. You would be poisoned to death by eating that. Okay, that's not a template for you to swallow. But the village template says, you know, when we have a problem, let's lay over what our Stone Age ancestry, what they did, okay? And, and the answer is they ate a variety of plant foods with some animal food. It was all unprocessed. It was all whole natural. It was all organic. But there wasn't any one food in it that, 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 that the integrity of the physical system was dependent upon. It's absolutely, totally absurd. And as Colin uh, has pointed out in numerous books, but particularly the last two, um, uh, whole, whole, I think, makes this argument better than, than anything, is he points out the extraordinary capabilities of the body to recirculate and reuse uh, food in, in, the, in the instance where you're particularly low in your diet in a given nutrient, in a given habitat, that the system is perfectly well of, of accommodating that. Of course it is, okay? So yeah, we are looking for help in all the wrong places was a important statement to make and basically say, listen, it's not from adding a bunch of anything that is gonna solve your problem. It's almost always gonna be the case that the, the pathological condition that you're suffering from is an imbalance caused by an excess, not by a deficiency. That is not 100% true of the time, but it is 99% true of the time. The other time, that's why we have Alan Goldhammer and Peter Sultana and True North Health Center and experts like that that can look at that and say, whoa, that's a funny looking blood panel. We ought to consider the possibility of a deficiency, okay? But that is the exception, it is not the rule. Yeah, and even most deficiencies when they do exist are the result and the consequence of other dietary excesses. You can create deficiencies with excess. So even though you might get some clinical benefit from supplementing something that correct the deficiency, ultimately the problem was usually excess. Got it. But just the fact we can take patients for 40 days on water only. No. And not only do they not succumb, they actually thrive. And it's clearly the efficiency of recycling. In fact, you can live longer on water only than you can on some isolated nutrition. Because if you just say eat white bread, you'll get deficiencies. Those the dietary excess will create deficiencies faster than living on water only. Yeah. That's that fabulous. But you hear that the blue zones, you know, the longest lived people, they all ate beans and nuts, but they also drank alcohol and they also ate fish. So, you know, uh, the, the blue zones are are willfully ignorant of a very uh, a, a number of extraordinarily important uh, facts about human nature that we won't discuss here. Uh, but the bottom line is, is that the blue, the inferences out of the blue zones are are scientifically indefensible. Okay, so I, I'm not interested uh, in that discussion, but the, the truth of the matter is the big things that we know from far wider epidemiological evidence than that is that you want to minimize animal food in the diet and you want to minimize the processing of the food in the diet. Those are the two big things you want to do. And uh, the quote inclusiveness of some specific food that, that they found in some blue zones that there's no magic food, people. No. Great. Thank you. So this next one, if there is going to be a disagreement, there might be a slight one here, or at least how the execution occurs. Oh, and thank God. <laughs> well, you know, you've been friends for over 50 years. And so this is where it comes to moderation. Yes. And I'll, I'll try to say it like Dr. Goldhammer does. Mm -hmm. If you could have controlled it, you would have controlled it. But you can't. So it's not you. So you can't have it. Moderation never works for an addict. Well, here's here's the problem with this whole thing. The problem, uh, as I spoke earlier, uh, when it comes to trying to understand nature and the impact on things, you, you have to look at things statistically. It's the only way to do it. So th these are the concept of effect sizes. Uh, in other words, what percentage of the outcome is as a result of variable one versus variable two versus variable three versus variable four. So someone's uh, obesity is an interaction between their gene variants, their diet, and their activity level, okay? And possibly some physiological compromise like a thyroid problem, 
Okay, so like literally, you could in principle have four variables in that equation, and one of them might be dominant, but it might almost never be the dominant feature in the population, like a thyroid problem. Okay, so almost everybody's obesity is caused by an interaction between their genes and their environment that we now confront, i.e. of overly rich food. If we get rid of the overly rich food, those people's genes are fine in a primitive environment and there's no obesity. So, the, so this question of how it is someone should approach the challenges of the pleasure trap is a parametric issue that depends upon who the individual is, what the nature is of their psychology, which specific food steps we're talking about, uh, and their physiological compromise with respect to, to, uh, to the problem. So you cannot bottle up a single prescription that, that really does justice to the complexity of the question. So in the, uh, when we wrote The Pleasure Trap, we were making a very, very strong point that people had not made which is that the food, food, modern food supply has a drug-like effect on the system and that, that uh, excessive, uh, excessive or dietary imbalances were the fundamental root of phys physical pathology in almost all cases, okay? Those two facts are true. And then the final fact is, what on earth are you supposed to do about it because you have been lured in by an evolutionary psychology that is let loose in a modern environment and you're not well defended. Uh, if you are in this trap and can't get out, one way to approach this problem is to approach it as if this is a effectively a drug, because what is a drug, okay? The, of course, you could you can make the case there's no in principle difference between a French fry and cocaine. They're really, you could say, well, there is. Well, this is matters of degree, yeah, okay? Is this an artificial stoking of the dopamine pathway? The answer is yes. If you if you uh, indulge in it, will you result in physiological compromise? Yes. Okay. So the so of course the argument is absolutely sound. And so Alan's Alan is just holding down one position. That position is totally defensible and completely reasonable. Okay. Uh, I I noted already in writing the pleasure trap. I smelled a motivational crisis, okay? I, uh, uh, Alan was just, you know, berating people and bullying people and telling them that this is what they needed to do to save their life. <laughs> that's, that's what he does. This guy is like a bulldozer and he's got one gear. You're either stopped or you're going forward and that's that. The, um, as the psychologist at True North, I'm listening a little bit carefully to the tears uh, and the confusion of people that I'm talking to. And little by little, I put together an understanding of what I call the ego trap, okay? So the ego trap is a, is a fascinating motivational dilemma where if you feel like you can't do something as well as is expected, your motivation is to bail out and not try at all. This is exactly what Simone Biles did in the Olympic Games. So Simone Biles was anointed the greatest gymnast in history before the game started and was expected to win everything, okay, because she's the great Simone Biles. And that young lady decided to bail out and quit, okay? Why? Right in the middle of the games. Why? Because she calculated that she had more to lose than she had to gain. This is a very interesting calculus. It's an esteemed dynamic calculus that's taking place. And so we, uh, when people approach this problem, they, they superficially, they, they significantly underestimate the pleasure trap. The pleasure trap, actually, interestingly enough, Alan and I underestimated the pleasure trap. Like we actually thought, hey, read this book, get your act together the world's going to start cleaning up its act because it's going to, after we explain it all to you, then it shouldn't be that hard, okay? And the truth of the matter is, we learned uh, as the decades passed that this thing is an unbelievably insidious monster that is almost impossible to not be in the trap, okay? It is extraordinary for people to get out of the trap. And so 
we didn't really see it that way because we didn't have that much trouble. So Alan had very little trouble getting out of the trap. I, I'm 95% out of the trap and got 95% out of the trap almost instantly once Alan explained it to me way back when in, in the later years of high school. So the point is, is that what we didn't understand is that we are unusual people and Alan's more unusual than I am. Okay. But, but we are both unusual people. I, I look around me and the people I interact with and th there are health motivated people and they're intelligent people. And I watch my decisions versus their decisions. And my decisions are overwhelmingly consistently more conservative than their decisions. And it's like, and I don't, and it's no big compromise to me. I wouldn't have it any other way. And if Alan watched me, he'd say, why are you doing that? Do it this way. Do it 10% better than you're doing. And he couldn't see why. In other words, so we're the freaks. Okay. We didn't know that we were the freaks. And the position that we took in the pleasure trap was, for God's sakes, treat this as a drug because it's swallowing your freaking whole life. How many tears are you going to shed over your excess weight? And for how long? How, how much compromise are you going to have in your whole right romantic dynamic for the rest of your damn life? How much courting are you going to do of self-inflicted freaking suicide? And why is it so great that you're going to be limping around, gasping for breath on a freaking ventilator when you're 64 years old? For Christ's sakes, people, wake up. So, of course, this position was a reasonable position. The, what, what I arrived slowly at, if you go back and look at my track record, sometime around 2006, I did a lecture for the McDougall program called the Continuum of Evil. Okay. That you're, you're starting to see me attack and try to grasp the problem of how it is that we balance out the pressure from the ego trap versus the insidious gravity of the pleasure trap that's trying to suck people down a vortex. And the truth of the matter is, for every individual, there is some equilibrium, but there either is an equilibrium that they can find that will work, or they're screwed and they're never going to find it. Okay. So the, in other words, so that's the, the issue. So it's not that we disagree. It's that there's a com complexity to this problem that we have to appreciate and know this though. So, you know, the, the pleasure trap is pretty obvious. If you have a little, you want a lot and it's hard. And the ego trap is a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, in depth, but the, the bottom, the way I can summarize part of it is that if you can't have any, you feel fine. You know, you have some, some consequences of that. And some people are really sensitive to the ego trap. And some people are really sensitive to the pleasure trap. Yes. And unfortunately, some people are sensitive to both. Sure. And, and if you're particularly sensitive to both, it's part of That's why you talk about, you know, loving, caring, kind people yeah. that worry about what other people think. It's harder to live in the world healthily than it is if you don't give a damn what other people think. Because you're not going to be as negatively affected when your behavior steps outside the norm. Yes. So if you're one of those loving, caring people that cares what people think and you're vulnerable to the pleasure trap, you're going to have to work a lot harder than somebody that maybe isn't that socially concerned or that maybe isn't that vulnerable to the pleasure trap. It just makes it a lot easier. And those of us that maybe aren't as vulnerable to the pleasure trap or ego trap sometimes have, understand, have trouble understanding why it's so difficult for other people to do the same thing that we're finding maybe not that difficult. And now, you know, I understand better now why and how the ego trap becomes such a big issue for people because I've watched, you know, what you said. I, mean, I couldn't believe that was just nonsense, psychological mumbo jumbo. But, and you remember how I fought against many of these things because it just right. didn't make any sense to me. Right. But now it turns out you were right. That is a big issue for some people. And so, you know, they have to navigate around it. Well, and it's even worse than that, which is a, a, um, a, a, a thing that we've had to come to, which, you know, uh, many sort of idealistic uh, young people that are trying to help the world and have a very good idea come to, is that you start to find out, guess what? That for many people, it's motivational checkmate. You, you, you were not, designed to be able to solve this problem okay so therefore there's nothing in anybody's prescription everybody who thinks they've got quote the answer to this problem oh no you don't 
All you have is at best the most comprehensive approach that you can come up with that may actually identify the most important tools that are possible. And then after that, you're done. The truth of the matter is, is that the vast majority of people will never escape the pleasure trap and it would be impossible for them to do so. Okay. So that, that is the brutal truth that has actually arrived, you know, and it's not because I'm jaded. It's because I look back through the situation and uh, what people don't know is that I've treated a hell of a lot of addiction. So the, you, you understand if you've done any, if you're a psychotherapist and you've spent any significant amount of time treating addiction, you will discover that there are highly motivated, incredibly intelligent, highly conscientious people that can't beat it. It's like, holy smokes. There, but for the grace of the genetic gods go I. That person has every bit my chops and they can't get out of that trap. Okay. So you start to realize, oh, there's nothing written in the stars that says that just because we've got a tricky problem that there's some prescription to solve it. Oh, no, that's not how life works, okay? The way life works is that human beings have created an unbelievably difficult, slippery problem for themselves, and that a certain percentage of people working all the angles can beat it. That's it, okay? So one prescription is, okay, well, if you haven't tried going all the way freaking cold turkey because you keep getting wrapped back into the pleasure trap, then freaking go cold turkey all the way down. If that, if you can't do that, but you might be able to hit 90%, then, then maybe you can do that and get some good out of it. Not as much good as if you went 100, but you can get a lot of good out of it. And then that, that's going to be a huge improvement of your life. Um, oh, but if it turns out if you do that, you get sucked down into the whole pleasure trap, and then you can't go all the way, then you're screwed. Okay, this is not my problem and it is not anybody's problem and there is no genius to solve it. This is the motivational crisis called the pleasure trap that human beings inflicted by their own ingenuity and there's not a damn thing that you can do about it right now. So maybe 400 years from now, you know, the futuristic psychiatry can go in and burn out a few of your brain cells and then you don't want to have the problem. But right now there is no such fix. Well, you know, and early on, um, I accidentally kind of stumbled across this because in order for people to care with us, they had to be highly motivated and they were self-selected because we were asking them to do something that sounded crazy, fasting. Right. And so the kind of people willing to consider fasting are not your normal, typical, average shows. These right. are highly motivated people, either motivated by, you know, pain, ability, and fear of death, or yeah. motivated intellectually, whatever it was. And so I noticed that those people were doing well and were a pleasure to work with. But right. if I tried to, like somebody would try to bring in a friend or a family member that wasn't self-selected, and they were like a nightmare because they had so much trouble with it. And I finally realized, no, you don't have to become a better doctor, a better teacher. You don't need to love people more. What you need to do is just get better at picking out people that are willing to get well. Right. And so by virtue of our filtration process, we've gotten better and better at picking people that are motivated and want to do what we're trying to get them to do. Those people do well, much better than actually we, you and I might have predicted early on. But if you try to generalize this, it's really frustrating. And that's why most doctors are so frustrated because they only have a tiny percentage of their practice of people that want to actually do this stuff. Whereas we get almost nothing but people that want to do this stuff. So the interns come in and they think, well, everybody's going to want to do this kind of stuff. And then they go out and open up a shingle and they find out nobody wants to do this kind of stuff. No. And That's so not. going back That's to our original thing, the key is not being a better doctor. It's picking better patients. Yeah. Yeah. And that that's a huge, I have to say that, that the people that I work with that call me are almost uniformly highly motivated and pretty well educated. And so it's actually a pleasure working with them. Uh, and uh, I have a phrase to describe the other folks. I call them a frog march. So in frog marching is when they tie people's hands behind their back and march them with a bayonet. Uh, that's I, I forget where I came from, French Revolution or something. And uh, anyway, uh, when I get some relative that's been frog marched to me, it's a nightmare. Like uh, this is, you know, th th this is going to be a long half an hour because I could tell it's a frog march. And uh, and so, you know, the for, fortunately. 19 out of 20 of my people aren't frog marches, but whenever it's a frog march, it's like, you know, that, that, that wrecks a quarter of a day for me. 
because they're they're frustrated and angry and I'm irritated and, and I want to put a thing on my thing, you know, don't call me unless you know what I'm about. <laughs> Well, that's why I always like to see patients from AJ because by the time yeah. she's educated, a lot of work has been done. Yeah, AJ is a great educator, invaluable. Yeah. Mm. So right. It sounds to me that that, that uh, whether a person is overweight has to do with their genetic potential plus their vulnerability to the pleasure trap. Yeah. That, that, not childhood trauma or all these other things. It seems like the pleasure trap is the most overlooked concept in medicine. Oh, of course. The, uh, and, and so it, it's also the one that medicine is utterly impotent to help with. So th this is a this is a behavior management educational process, uh, and, and it only is going to be germane to a relatively small percentage of the population. So medicine has utterly no interest in this, and uh, there's no there's no money in it. There's no pill that you can patent and sell, and so forget it. You know. So we are. We're wandering around a landscape that that there, there's no there's no really serious competitors, and most of the people that are talking are talking very similar dialect. Okay, so you know we we don't have substantive disagreements with Engine Two or John McDougall or Colin Campbell or Caldwell. In other words, uh, Neil Barnard. We're all talking the same language. We have interesting little stylistic differences and a few little pet theories that we have. But we're all pretty much on the same page. And the reason why is that we've all seen it work. We all know. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I wasn't going to take questions, but somebody sent this one in and it, it relates to what we just talked about from Linda saying, as a person with an addictive personality, I struggle with the ability to say no. So I can make a perfectly healthy dessert from Chef AJ or others using all the right ingredients. The problem comes with the ability to stop at one piece of a dessert. If I like it, I will eat it. How do I address this and never be never being able to eat dessert? Chef AJ says we can eat all we want and still lose weight. See, they don't really listen to me when it comes to calorie density because my desserts, unless they're just fruit, are not to the left of the red line. Because when you're putting in dates, which I do, I make compliant desserts, but they're not calorically dilute. Or when you're putting in oats that aren't cooked in water, they're not to the left of the red line. So I think people hear what they want to hear. Yeah, uh, the tr truth of the matter, this is exactly what Alan uh, and I were just trying to discuss that if you are an individual that can't stay out of the artificially high calorie dense food, even if it's healthy biochemically, but it's a problem for your weight, then if that's who you are, then that's who you are. Okay, and Alan would say, well, then don't eat it. Um, I would I, say that if you close your eyes and you feel like something really, really, really is attractive, you really, really want it, you know you can't have it because you get nothing. You know, the reality is you really, 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 really want it because it's part of the pleasure trap. It doesn't mean you won't enjoy eating. You will enjoy eating, but it's not the same kind of overwhelming feeling that there is. So that's a simple way. Just look at it and think, it, if it's going to bring you joy and comfort, don't have it. I just want to make one other there's point. One, uh, there's only one of these on planet Earth, and man, it's it's entertaining as all get out. You know, we've got one other, I think, important consideration here. You know, people were like, you notice that this year life expectancy continues to come down. You know, and, and although there may be some good things to that, like they say it's going to help uh, actuarialize Social Security, uh, the reality is that life expectancy isn't the most important thing to most people. Life expectancy is the average age of person who live that's born today. What people are really concerned about in my experience is healthy life experience. They wanna know that they're gonna live until they die, that they're gonna have a good life, a good death, or go to bed one night and not wake up, not spend 10 years or 20 years debilitated waiting for the kids to have to change their diapers. And so it's how long you live, life expectancy, unfortunately is largely based on genetics and love. But healthy life expectancy is heavily influenced by the choices you make, your diet, your sleep, your exercise. And so the promise here isn't that people are gonna live forever, it's that they can live in close proximity to their um, death without having as much stability. So we're trying to reduce the likelihood of stability, not necessarily pretending that you're gonna live forever. And so if you understand what the price you're paying is, you're giving up certain indulgences so that the last 10 or 20 years of your life can be the richest, best years, instead of being debilitated and having to be dependent on other people, sometimes that might make you know, the, the things seem more rational 
uh, to people like, why would you possibly give up any short-term pleasure-seeking self-indulgent behavior? Nice. You know, we have done nine questions and we promised them 10. So if you don't mind, we have to do one more. All the ones so far were things Alan said. I mean, Dr. Goldhammer said. So this is the first thing I actually heard Dr. Lyle say when I met him at True North. He was giving a lecture. It wasn't even on weight loss. And he literally said, we must work harder on our environment than we do ourselves." Yeah. Yeah, what he said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The truth is, is that um, uh, I, it's interesting that I said that back then because I know more now than I did then. And um, what uh, what I knew then was that I knew that your personality was not very subject to change. And so at that point, my reading as a literature uh, was, uh, it looked like 60, 62% of the variance was in the genes and that 38% of the variance was, was in the environment. That, that's what the, the best estimates were. In other words, we're mostly who it is that we are and therefore, um, therefore working on that isn't as important as working on the environment that you find yourself in. Uh, since that time, I have determined uh, to my own satisfaction that personality is 100% genetic and that there's no influence at all from the environment. The, uh, I can defend that in any debate with any scientist on earth. So the, uh, they, they are, I had not thought this through at the level uh, that was necessary to actually figure it out until I read Robert Plowman's book a couple of years ago, uh, published in 2020 called Blueprint. Uh, Plowman himself is, is a, a very interesting man who carefully weighs his words because he knows that what he's saying is in, in fundamentally very inflammatory. So he figures out mealy mouth ways to say exactly what I just said. And yet he's pointing out the statistical evidence that indicates that it's exactly what I'm actually saying. Personality does not change. The only thing that changes is the circumstances that you're in. The circumstances that you're in can massively modify your behavior. And when we say, uh, so for example, if I put a gun to the mafia chieftain's head, they're going to get real cooperative really fast, okay? If I pull the gun away and one of his guys, you know, shoots me in the knee and knocks me over the head, now I'll look out. The chieftain's going to say, waste the guy. In other words, all sense of agreeable has now gone out of that guy's soul. So the point is, and you could put me in a Russian prison right now, I'd be very unhappy and depressed and miserable and anxious, but I'm not in a Russian prison. So I'm actually very comfortable and happy and everything's good. So you're, when we say that the environment doesn't impact your personality, we're not saying the environment doesn't impact your life. The environment has an enormous impact on your life. Okay. But the environment does not impact your personality, your natural characteristics about how it is that you're different than every other human on earth. Those are in, in violet. Those do not change. And so if you're, however it is that you're struggling with some issue, particularly in and around the pleasure trap or anything else, the solution to the problem is not to say, well, gee, if I could only be more self-disciplined, you're not going to be more self-disciplined. Gee, if I could only, you know, do this or do that or be this way, if I could just be more assertive and tell people no, well, you're not going to be more assertive and you're not going to tell people no. So therefore, the solution to the problem is not if only I could be this way or that way, we could just put a big red line through that because that's not happening. So what is the solution? If you need to improve your life, you need to improve your circumstances so that your environmental context is more conducive to your personality. That's what you must do. Okay. And so that's, that's what I was formulating. And that's what bubbled out of my mouth 10 years ago. I was already getting there, but I hadn't quite, I hadn't gotten as far as I am now. Now I'm relentless about it. It's like, okay, no, forget it. We're not even talking about changing anything about you. We must, in fact, figure out how to change your environmental context. That is what we're going to do because that's all we can do. Okay. So that's, yeah, work harder. That means if you got a problem, you need to be working on your environment. How can I make my environment? more conducive to the self-discipline that I have. That's how we're going to do that. Okay. So, yep, that is the, that's, it's not only um, a solution to the problem, it's the only solution to the problem.
Would you agree, Dr. Goldhammer? He said. Well, you, you're, you're an analogy is that the environment also doesn't change your height either. But your environment is very conducive to, 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 to staying on track. That is not um, by accident, AJ. That's because I recognize what he's saying is true. So I spend an inordinate amount of energy trying to create an environment, including to the point of selecting patients that are going to be successful and make us look good. So, you know, it, it, takes, it takes actually more energy, but it, it, it doesn't take, it takes less energy to work with highly motivated self-selected people than it does angry antagonistic people. And so we try everything we can to attract people that are going to be successful and discourage people that are not going to be successful uh, in implementing our program. And we're fortunate to be in a position where there's more people who want to do that or think they want to do it then we can actually accommodate. And so we're able to kind of cherry pick out those really good, highly motivated, self-selected people that can be successful with what we're doing. And that is the secret to our success. Not that we're necessarily better educators or better treaters or even better doctors, but we do work with much, much better patients. Great, well, thank you. And thank you, Sue and Angela for the super chat. Is there anything you guys wanna ask me as we wind up this wonderful uh, birthday? Yeah, I was wondering, you must uh, have significant levels of satisfaction changes seeing that what the message you've been trying to communicate for so long has now actually become more and more acceptable and you're able to reach a broader and broader audience. What, so what do you attribute that to? Is it changes that are made in you or is it changes that have happened in the environment? Well, I, I, I take everything. I mean, I hang on every word both you guys say. I'm like a little parrot, like, and I can just, I spew what you both say as the gospel. And I, I just, I feel like you both are experts on this and I just take it very seriously. So basically I just do everything you both say. I don't think I've ever gone against, I mean, sometimes I go against Dr. Lyle's advice when I have sessions about how to deal with people. I, I'm terrible with that. But when it comes to navigating the pleasure trap, I, I mean, I, I just went in as a blank slate. You told me what to do. I did it. And I just assumed everybody would do that. But you know what? They don't. Oh. <laughs> you, you've had a great deal of success, AJ, and your ability to communicate this. I mean, the fact that you're coming up on 200,000 YouTube subscribers this tells you that that is a that is an enormous amount of people. When you think, you know, the 49ers stadium or giant stadium in San Francisco holds about 50,000 people. You think about four that stadium being full four times. I mean, that's an, an enormous. Uh, I mean, we just couldn't in previous eras. You couldn't have that kind of an impact on that many people unless you were Ernest Hemingway. And so it's a. Uh, it's a, it's a tribute to your message and your consistency, and you have a personal transformation story that is real, and uh, and and it it has had longevity to it, so it has tremendous credibility, and it's earned. So you've done a, an outstanding job. Well done. Oh, thank you so much. And thanks both of you for creating this monster. You know, this is episode 1,440. And coincidentally, there's 1,440 minutes of the day. And I can't imagine spending my minutes on my birthday with anybody other than you two. So thank you so much. My pleasure, AJ. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Dr. Goldhammer. Bye. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow at 11, where we have Elaine LaLanne, the wife of Jack LaLanne, celebrating her 97th birthday. 